We're going to take a look now at a distribution, which is based on the binomial coefficient, the binomial distribution. As a reminder, the binomial coefficients n choose r, you can compute them with this formula. n factorial divided by n minus r factorial times r factorial. And I need to remind you that when you do the product of two factorials, you cannot just multiply the insides and then use the factorial on them. The binomial distribution relies on the idea of a Bernoulli trial. So it's a random experiment where there's only two possible outcomes, success and failure. So heads or tails, old, young, and so forth. We'll say P denotes the probability of a success and it's fairly random, which one we say fairly arbitrary, which one we use for the success and the failure. A binomial experiment well, that is you repeating n independent Bernoulli trials, and each one of them has the same probability of success. The word independent here is actually quite important. If the trials are not independent, then you're not talking or you're not working with a binomial. So examples of binomial experiments would be looking at the ratio of female to male births over a large population. Now, are these really independent? Well, if you have the same set of parents for each birth, perhaps they're not quite as independent as you'd like. But in practice, a pair doesn't give birth to that many kids. And so you can probably hope that on the average, uh, these would be independent. Or if you look at a production line, you like to come up with a probability of, you know, 85% of the items being produced being satisfactory as opposed to defective. Or if you sample with replacement with two types of items. These are all examples of binomial experiments. In such experiments, you're interested in the probability of obtaining a certain number of successes. Let that be X, that's our random variable. It is discrete because the number of successes you may have cannot be larger than the number of experiments you ran, it has to be non-negative and it cannot be a fractional number, right? So if you run n experiments, you're gonna have zero, one, two, n minus one, or n successes. And the probability of having uh, x successes out of n experiments would be given by this formula here. This is the probability mass function for the binomial distribution. We'll often abbreviate this whole setup by saying that x follows the distribution denoted by b for binomial with n trials, each of them being independent Bernoulli trials, and probability of success in one such trial being equal to b. So whenever you see this, what we're really saying is if the number of trials is 1, if x follows a Bernoulli with one trial and probability of success B, then the probability that you will have no successes would be one minus P, because P is the probability of success, and the probability of having one success would be P. In that case, the expectation of the number of successes, if you only run the experiment once, well, it would be according to the formula, the probability of there being no success, one minus p times the number of no success, so that's zero, plus the probability of there being one success, p, times the probability of, or times the number of success, which is one, you work it out, you get p. So the expectation of the number of successes, if you only want one experiment, would be the probability of success. Now, if you're running more than one experiment, if you're running n of them, the probability of getting exactly x successes, that's what we saw on the previous slide. And you can show, although we will not show it, you could show that the expectation of that random variable, which is the sum of the probability of, well, zero successes, one success, all the way up to n, each one of those weighed by the actual number of successes x, that's the expectation of a random variable, right? is simply going to be n times the probability of success. Because these trials are independent, the number of successes previously don't affect the number of successes after, then 
you have the probability of one success being P, and you have N experiments, which would be N times the probability of having one success in one of the independent failing. The variance, that's the expectation of the square of the difference between the random variable and its expectation. If you remember, we had that the variance was this thing. Well, we've just said that the expectation here was in P. So that gives you the summation of the probability of getting X successes, but now it is weighed by the expression that's found here, number of successes minus NP squared. And if you work it out, you get NP times one minus. For now, we're not showing you how you get these results. Later, when we talk about um, the sums of discrete random variables, we will see that these expectations, the variance as well, are, you know, are derived fairly naturally. But for now, we just remember these formulas. The expectation of a binomial variable with parameters n and p would be n times p, and the variance of the same binomial variable would be np times 1 minus p. For example, suppose that you're going to be testing water samples in some region, and we'll consider that um, when the water sample is polluted, that's a success. A success, but for the purposes of having one of those be a success, we'll say that uh, pollution is a success. You're testing for pollution. This is what works. Let's pretend that the, um, the probability of success then is 10%. Roughly speaking, 10% of your samples should be polluted. Well, that's not really what this is saying. This is saying that whenever you run the experiment, there's a 10% chance that the sample will be polluted. It's not quite the same thing, right? Now, you're going to pick 12 samples independently. Perhaps you're asking 12 graduate students to go out there and select the samples. If they are independent, it's reasonable to model the number of polluted samples as a binomial distribution 12 trials with a probability of success being 10%. Now, what's the expectation of this random variable? What is this variance? Look at that. What's the probability that you will get exactly three polluted samples in your set of 12? And you see what I mean? We're not saying that 10% of samples are polluted, just that for every one of these trials, there's a 10% chance of being polluted, because otherwise this question here would make no sense. And what's the probability that in your 12 tests, you will get 0, 1, 2, or 3 polluted samples? So it's a binomial distribution. We know the expectation and the variance. We have formulas for them. All we really need to do here is to substitute the values of n and p from the problem into these expressions for the expectation and the variance. Well, we have n equals to 12 and p equals to 0 0.1. 12 times 0 0.1, 1.2 and 12 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 is 1.08. On average, we would expect 10% of the samples to be polluted. On average, we would expect that out of 12 runs, 1.2 of them would be polluted. So if each of you does 12 tests, and you count the number of polluted samples in your 12 tests, and then we do the average of everybody's number of polluted samples, we would expect that number to be 1.2 or close to 1. And the variance, again in the same setup, would be 1.08. We're not all going to get 1.2, it's impossible, right? I mean, we have to have a, a discrete integer number of successes. But the variance around 1.2 would be 1.08, which seems to suggest that there would be a fair number of tests with one, a fair number of them with two, but not that many that would have five, six, seven, eight. Let me take a, a quick look at, at the numbers here. For instance, what's the probability of having exactly three successes? Here you would use the probability mass function. For discrete random variables, that's what the PMF does. It tells you what the probability of, well, the random variable taking on any of the allowable values. If x equals three, you replace x by 3 in the expression for the PMF. You have an n value, which is 12, a p value, which is 0.1. That doesn't change. And then you have an x, which is 3. If you remember, the general formula was the probability of having x successes would be n choose x, p, in this case, x, and 1 minus p, n minus x. So we just replace n, x, and p 
as they appear in this problem in this formula for the PMF here. This is going to give us 12 choose 3 times probability of success 0.1 to the third power times the probability of failure 0.9 times, well, all of the other instances where we have failures, which is 9, and the grand total here is about 8%. There's only 8% chance, or 8.5% if you want, that you will have exactly three successes. Now, if we're looking at the question, what's the probability of having fewer than or equal to three successes? We need to remember what this means. The probability of having fewer than or equal to three successes would be the probability of having zero success, plus the probability of having one success, plus the probability of having two successes, three successes, and so forth. Uh, in general, in general, you try to avoid computing these things uh, directly. I mean, if you don't mind so much computing one of them here, but if you have to compute more than one, it be can become a little bit of an annoyance. So we look at tables of the cumulative distribution function, which is what this is. And a lot of these values have, have been tabulated for common or reasonable values of n and of x, except could very well be that the one that you're interested in isn't available. So you have to find some other way to compute these things. And we'll talk about how to use R to compute these. Uh, but this one has been tabulated and there's a little table if you want. And you can actually see that, I'll show you how to do that. The probability of having zero, one, two, or three successes, which is to say zero, one, two, or three polluted samples in your set of 12 is about 97%. Well, that's pretty high, which means that the probability of having more than three successes is fairly low at about 2.5 or 2.6%. Yeah, that makes sense. If there's a 10% chance that a sample will be polluted and you pick 12, you would not expect to see nine polluted samples. It can happen. It is not a probability of zero. It's just not a very likely outcome. And you can also use the table here to compute the probability that we had computed above with the formula. What's the probability of having exactly three successes? Well, that would be the commutative probability of having less than or equal to three successes minus the probability of having less than or equal to two successes. There's only one thing that's left here. It would be the probability of having exactly three successes. And these numbers are given each of them by the table. You subtract one from the other and you get 0 0.0853, which is pretty close to the value that we had here. There's a rounding error because when we're reporting on these commutative probabilities, we're reporting them to a certain number of decimals. And uh, there's a rounding error because the reality is that this isn't just a four number decimal, it, wrote, it goes on and so is this one. If you were to really compute it with enough decimals, you could get 0 0.0852, but you don't know when you see the table what the rest of the decimals were, so you might get so where do we find this? In your tables, you would look for the value of n. In this case, the value of n is 12. That's the number of trials. And then you identify the number of successes is three. And then these values, these columns here represent the different values of p. So this is a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so forth, all the way up to 0 0.9. We don't need to put the probability zero and the probability of one, because then there would be zero percent chance of having three success. If everything is always going to be success, you would have 12 successes and there's zero percent chance of having three successes in the opposite type. If you never get a success, then it's impossible for you to get three success. Right? So they don't need to be looking at So you would identify this number here corresponding to your prob probability of success of 0.1 and trials you want three successes, there's your cumulative number, 0.9704. That follows a binomial of 12, 0.1. Now you say, well, what if my probability of success wasn't one or 10%? What if it was 15%? I don't have a column for 15%. Then presumably you might want to do the average of what happens at 10% and what happens at, this is not exact. And good tables would have more than just these columns here. It's just it's hard to know ahead of time what probability you'd be interested in so the book can tabulate all of the possible values. Much wiser nowadays that we have access to these computing software to compute the probability directly using the software. We'll see how you can do that shortly.
Imagine another situation. You have an airline that sells, say, 101 tickets for a flight where there's only 100 seats. And here the airline is banking on some people canceling or not showing up. Right? That happens in practice. Now, perhaps we know from past data that whenever somebody has a ticket, there's a 97% probability of them showing up for the flight. So about 3% of people with tickets don't show up for their What's the actual probability of there being exactly 101 passengers showing up? In which case, the airline is overbooked the flight. Afterwards, we'll wonder what happens if uh, that number is 125 instead of 100. So we'll say that X is the number of passengers that show up. A success is when a passenger shows up. We want to compute the probability that there will be more than 100 people showing up. Now we have 101 experiments, so our N will be equal to 101. The number of success, in this case, X, we want it to be greater than 100. We want it to be exactly equal to 101. If we assume that the passengers show up independently of one another. So that means here in particular that we're assuming that no people are traveling as families or traveling together. Or that, you know, they're all taking the bus or the subway to get to the airport and there wasn't, you know, some, some defect or some issue on the line or who knows what, right? In reality, it's probably not realistic to make that assumption all of the time. So for the time being, we can assume that that's going to be the case and see where that goes. If that's the case, then what we're interested in is looking at a binomial distribution with n equals 101 trials and the probability of success being 97%. And we want to know what's the probability that we are going to get 101 passengers showing up that we're going to overbook the flight. Well, we literally use the probability mass function here because the probability of being greater than 100 is going to have to be the same as the probability of having exactly 101 passengers showing up. And then we can use the PMF directly, replace n by 101, replace p by 0.97, and replace x by 101. And this you can compute directly. It is about 5%. There's a 5% chance that the airline will overbook the flight. If instead of 101 tickets that have been sold, they sold 125. So now we replace n by 125. What you're interested in is still the probability that more than 100 passengers show up, but the parameters of the distributions have changed. And so now you do not have x following a binomial distribution with 101 trials and 97% probability of success. It is going to be a binomial with 125 trials and a 97% of success. So when you want to compute the probability that you have more than 100 passengers showing up, it isn't just going to be the probability of having 101 passengers showing up. Right, the probability of having more than 100 will be 1 minus the probability of having 100 or fewer. And here we have to use the formula at this point. So this would be 1 minus the sum of, well the number of successes could go from 0 to 100, so x varies from 0 to 100, and then we just literally use the PMF here for each of those. So this is actually a fairly complicated sum to compute, right? This would be 1 minus the probability of having nobody show up, minus the probability of having one person show up, minus the probability of having two people show up, all the way up to the probability of having 100 people show up. You can compute each of them using this formula here, but you have to compute 101 of them. And that, that's a bit of a pain in the backside. As I said, later we will see that there's a fast way or quick way of doing this using, for instance, R. But you would notice here that the probability is very nearly 0.999, of the to it, which is to say that if there's a 97% chance that people show up when they purchase a ticket and you sell 125 tickets to a flight that only has 100 seats, then there's nearly a 100% chance that the flight will Assuming that, I said, whether people show up in time for their flight or not is an independent.